Hello, I'm Andrew Kern. I've worked in sustainability with a focus on recycling for over 15 years. The last 14 I've worked with Smurfit Kappa, working with recycling plants, mill supply, recycling programs for various manufacturing and distribution sites. I've also helped develop a renewable fuel supply network, replacing fossil fuels for our Texas Mills bioboiler, and worked with mills and recycling plants all over the United States and the world. I want to focus on a few things today throughout this webinar. One, collaboration, two, innovation, and three, keep it simple. But before we get to all of that, I'd like to share a story with you. I've told this short story before, but I believe it's worth telling once again. The most notable load of trash in history, the story of the Mobro 4000. No, it's not a science fiction movie. In 1987, landfill scape space was, in New York was becoming scarce. An entrepreneur had an idea that he would export trash to other states where landfill space wasn't as scarce. So on March 22nd, the Marlboro 4000 set sail. A barge full of 3,000 tons of trash departed New York, bound for a landfill in Moorhead, North Carolina. Soon after starting this voyage, voyage, local news in New York picked up the story, and of course, so did its intended destination. Citizens were not keen on the idea of receiving someone else's trash, so the barge was refused in North Carolina, and the waste sailed on. Then came Louisiana, Texas, Florida. All intended destinations had the same result, and media coverage grew as the garbage continued its trip. Belize, Mexico, and Cuba were attempted, but there were, there were a barge was faced, faced the Mexican Navy and threats of artillery fire if they attempted to deliver and the news coverage continued to grow. After traveling 6,000 miles at sea, being refused at countless ports, the Marlboro concluded its trip back where it all started. A Brooklyn judge ordered the material to be incinerated, and the barge returned to Islip, New York, where it ultimately was destroyed. Greenpeace famously put up a sign on the barge, and a huge spark for recycling was set off. There was no turning back. This single event captured the attention of the nation and changed our industry forever. Some estimates were that over 50% of what was on that barge was OCC, corrugated boxes or old corrugated containers, which are now the most recycled material in the United States. Paper makes up over 60% of the recycled municipal solid waste in the US. This incident changed how we manage waste in this country. The average citizen was increasingly aware of their waste and it was a catalyst for activism and change. In the 10 years that followed, we saw recycling grow at unprecedented rates. This even had, had, has influenced how recycling has been developed in this country and around the world. It seems to me that we're in the middle of two major events whose potential for change is even greater than that, than that barge of trash departing New York in 1987. Traditional and social media coverage is extensive surrounding these events, which has motivated increased activism. What the future holds can can be unknown, but one thing is certain, legislation. We've already seen legislative impacts from China. They've had a zero waste, zero recycled plastic import goal for 2017 that has been achieved, virtually achieved and a paper goal for 2022. The de-escalation de of scrap imports is obvious. It's radically altered how recycling markets operate, with plastics being the most adversely affected. There appears to be growing public interest in legislation close to home as well as abroad. Go growing public awareness of greenwashing and activism surrounding education. So what are we to do? I'm going to talk today about some major components in sustainability and make some key points to consider. Collaboration, innovation, and keeping it simple. Yes. But first, an agenda of topics to cover and talk a little bit about greenhouse gases, recycling, compostable versus biodegradable. And I'm gonna start off with greenhouse gases. I recently spoke at a career day at my kids' elementary school. It was mainly focused on my job and how recycling works. I was amazed at how engaged the kids were and I was up, and I was up against another dad who was engineering robots. During the Q&A, CO2 and greenhouse gases came up. We're talking nine to 12 year olds. Our future, they're bright and they're also engaged. Climate change is an important perspective to consider when evaluating sustainability goals. It's certainly a driving consumer and customer, driving consumer and customer expectations in how all companies conduct their business. 
and there are abundance of gases that contribute to greenhouse gas emissions and this climate and thus climate change. Among them, carbon dioxide or CO2, methane gas, um, nitrous oxide, and fluorinated gases. The focus is generally on CO2 as they represent the bulk of these gases affecting climate change. In fact, the EPA estimated in the U.S. 81% of the greenhouse gases emitted were from CO2. With less than one-tenth of a percent of CO2 coming from the pulp and paper industry, it's a relatively low industrial emitter of greenhouse gases. At this point, I think we all are familiar with recycling or the conversion of discarded product into a new marketable product, but there are some distinct points I'd like to make while we, we cover the topic of recycling. One, collection does not always equal recycle. Two, greenwashing mainly happens when we count collection as recycling. And three, sorting recycling has evolved, but is still primarily me mechanical in nature. Recycling is not complete when it's picked up behind your house or at a business. That's where it starts. In some businesses, materials are pre-sorted so that when they are picked up, they can go directly to the facility that converts the material into a new product. But for most of, the, of Americans, pickup is still a ver at the very early stage of the process. Material recovery facilities, or MRFs, process the material into various commodities. This is done through dimensional or compositional pro properties, sometimes touched by humans and often done by mechanical measures. This can create challenges to getting the appropriate commodities put together for their intended end users. You may have heard of robotics and AI entering our industry, and they are certainly on the horizon, but I do not believe they're the panacea of change we are hoping for. While industrial recycling or business recycling tends to fare better due to the tighter control of what enters the stream, residential recycling averages around 25% con contamination and in some cases closer to 35%. We've come a long way but the most sustainable products are the ones that go back into similar products. A box into a box, a bottle into a bottle, you kind of get the picture. The CO2 savings of recycling is huge versus the process of utilizing virgin, virgin raw materials. For every ton of recycled material on average, a two to four tons of CO2 emission is saved. Not to mention, it le lessens the demand for these, res these uh, valuable virgin resources minimizing valuable landfill space and thus reducing the greenhouse gas emissions that come out of landfills. I'd like to spend a minute or two to delve deeper into various recycled materials by category. I'm going to start with metal and glass. Um, as the charts illustrate, recovery has improved over time but has remained relatively static over recent years. These, these materials are indefinitely recyclable but they can damage equipment and do present safe handling challenges. They are not compostable, and that, but they do present huge energy cost savings versus their virgin counterparts. Then, now I'm going to talk a little bit about plastics. In plastics, we find very low collection rates, as we see in the chart. Coupled with massive growth of use, the variation of polymers in use makes sorting these products challenging. The crackdown on recycling plastic imports in China has made recycling difficult, and while it still happens, it has made greenwashing less likely. Ones, or PET, are many of the common plastic bottles from your kitchen and are readily recyclable in most parts of the world and across the United States. The same goes for number twos, commonly in milk jugs. These are HDPE. These plastic grades have, been, have, have, have substantial, substantial national and global outlets, but the others the other plastic rates often only have regional end users, if any at all. Currently, most plastics that are recycled are done are downcycled, meaning they're going into a lesser grade of plastic and rarely go and rarely go back into the same patch, packaging type. Due to inconsistent markets and little to no recovery value for the for some plastics, they frequently cause issues contaminating other recycling materials, and all plastics are largely responsible for ocean waste. OCC um, is one of the more common paper grades, but they're all paper recycling is 100% recyclable. It can be recycled up to seven times. It's both compostable and biodegradable. It's part of an established worldwide circular economy. And during the height of China's import of OCC, one in every 
four bales made in the United States was exported to China. Packaging collection has been rising for some time. Even though we've seen a drop in usage, a large portion of that drop is due to news and writing papers as people have transitioned to a more digital consumption. There can be li limits to paper-based packaging, practical packaging, but it's very versatile. I'm going to talk a little bit about biodegradable and comp compostable. Um, biodegradable is not the same as compostable. And I want to set aside a big myth, that, and that is that trash breaks down in a landfill. The truth is, organics are not meant to break down in landfills. There are instances of 40-year-old newspapers found that are still legible, 10-year-old carrots with orange color, and 20-year-old meat still on the bone. If these items break down outside of the land landfill with air, um, aerobic, aerobic decomposition happens and produces lower, more sustainable levels of CO2 emissions. That's one of many reasons why we want to minimize what goes in landfills. Biodegradable, on the other hand, product, those products are typically re require industrial um, comp composting sites. To make matters worse, anaerobic decomposition of organics, like what happens when they are stored in a landfill, creates methane, which is one of those nasty greenhouse gases we want to avoid. Some of the bioplastic solutions that are biodegradable find themselves in the recycling streams and contaminate um, recyclable plastics because they don't always work well with the end users. Composting. So if it grows, it goes, is how the saying goes. Think backyard compost like your grandparents may have done for their gardens. It's those organic things that break down into fertile soil with relative ease. Cellulose or, or is the foundation for most paper-based packaging, is an alternative ingredient and is easy to compost. It requires much less mechanical treatment and energy to break down than into, into valuable soil and soil amendments. This Venn diagram that you'll see on the, on the screen, it's a simple but, but effective way to highlight how sustainable packaging solutions from paper fiber are. Not all products can make the same claim. It should be a little surprise that according to the most recent data from the EPA, one-fourth of all trash generated is cellulose-based. Nearly half of all disposed paper is recycled or composted and in large part that's due to the sustainable properties and robust and well-developed end markets for those materials. My expertise is focused on recycling, but after years spent around, when, around and working with sustainable experts and their endeavors across the country, I've come to a conclusion that there are three great barriers to sustainability goals, and unfortunately they are intertwined like a tangled knot. One, critical mass. Air is our enemy, not explicitly greenhouse gases, though that plays a part, but the inefficiencies of shipping air. Co-mingled collection helps offset the fi financial as well as CO2 costs of collection, thus requiring fewer trucks and miles covered and more efficient uses of energy and materials. Two, over choice. It's fantastic that now we can co-mingle all these recycling commodities, but what stays in, what goes? What works and is efficient to collect and process in one part of the country or world doesn't work in another. When confronted with choice, many well-meaning people trying to do the right thing but make the wrong choice. That leads to finally contamination. At best, a long ride to the landfill and at worst, contamination to our waterways and the environment. It creates waste in every step of the process. In collection, it can waste CO2, labor, energy, equipment fatigue at the processing site and ultimately the end user or the site where the site actually recycles it into a new product, we see repetition of those same wasteful components. So this is all pretty bleak stuff. So many obstacles. I'm a fan of a quote by Rick Warren. He's a pastor of a large church on the west coast and while it's spiritual and personal in nature, aren't we all people that make organizational and choices for our companies and ultimately make decisions impacting those groups? His quote is this, there's no growth without change, no change without loss, and no loss without pain. So how do we untangle this string? What pain from loss can we expect and how do we facilitate change, change, uh, this change through growth? If you've ever asked a CrossFit person about CrossFit, you've probably lost 45 minutes of your day. But you might also have picked up that there is, is pain and change, and change, but ultimately, ultimately there is growth at the end. So we come back to three takeaways. 
One, seek out collaboration. Two, innovation. And three, keep it simple. I'm going to start with keeping it simple. So how do, how do we do that? How do we keep it simple? I think the obvious answer is by leaning into, circular, uh, into choices that build on existing circular economies. Circular is a hot button for a good reason. A box into a box, a bottle into a bottle. It keeps things simple, minimizes over choice, and makes critical mass more attainable. It also cooperates with current collection trends. Most of the major waste, waste haulers and recycling companies are now pr promoting a similar message, know what to throw. And that emphasizes cardboard, paper, metal can, plastic bottles, and plastic jugs. If the packaging falls outside of that category, it won't be part of the National Education Program for Recycling due to the limitations and inconsistencies for in markets and recycling programs across the country. Two other components they're focusing on is empty, clean, and dry, and don't bag it. Those efforts are all aimed at minimizing overchoice, resulting in less contamination, and you guessed it, helping build upon critical mass. All this leads you to the most challenging aspects, possibly, um, but also the most fulfilling, collaboration and innovation. To help get your mind centered around what that might look like, I'm going to guide you through some samples and highlight how they help untangle these obstacles. I'm going to start, start off with Spoken Hub. Um, distribution, big box retail, and grocery have implemented these models for years. It's the model that most of our recycling plants utilize to, apl to apply to, various, uh, to a variety of changing service platforms to maximize recovery of recycled materials, to reach its most efficient potential. It often requires collaborative efforts and partnerships. We work with one of our recycling partners, stores, and one of their major suppliers and our recycling group to maximize efficiencies and unlock economic potential for all three organizations. Oh, and by the way, we also reduced <clears throat> empty lanes that semi-trucks were running, eliminated dead miles, saving on CO2, saved on CO2, maximized effective use of trucking, service and warehouse equipment, manpower resources, and limited driver time. Supply Smart. Working with Smurf Capital to work up and down the value chain to promote more sustainable and efficient processes. Evaluating the supply chain, not only from a packaging standpoint, but how those packages impact freight, production, and operational factors. Innovate to reduce overchoice. It's, this is one, uh, one product that I think is fantastic. It replaces foam inserts. And I kind of call it a one toss packaging because after the product is removed, the entire package can then be recycled without having to worry about overchoice. Nor grip, another option, remove eliminates hard to capture and hard to recycle components and can eat and then that can be difficult to recycle and replaces them with circular solutions so that they can be recycled more easily. Bag and box. Again, two products, two, two materials that can be easily separated so that recycling becomes more e easy. And finally, top clip. Replacing unrecyclable, unrecyclable materials with something along the circular supply line that can be easily removed. and re easily recycled. I'm here today at the Smurf Kappa Experience Center in Dallas, Texas, one of many global buildings designed by Smurf Kappa specifically for innovation and collaboration. I challenge you all to rethink how we address packaging waste. With some pain, we can push forward and grow through innovation and collaboration. And by building on the simplicities, simplicity of circular economies, Please join us at Smurf Cap in our efforts to address this envi these environmental challenges. We are eager to work together and help. We have experience, in ce experience centers worldwide that are created to be hubs of design for innovation and collaboration. If you want to reach out to us, please visit our website. And if you have questions about this presentation specifically, feel free to email me at andrew.kern, K-E-R-N, at smurfitkappa.com. We'd love to hear from you and work together to make packaging waste extinct.